<laughs> right, we've just got um, a little bit of technology problems will get fixed. Okay, well, welcome everybody to this policy and strategy meeting. And I'd like to acknowledge that we've got um, two people on Zoom, Councillor Hill and Neil Lindsay. And I'd like to um, also Darren Palmer. Um, and just before we start, I'd like to uh, ask uh, Board Member Graham to come to the table and welcome her to the meeting. So I'm sure there's a seat there beside Councillor Dowling. She might. And Councillor McKenzie, would you like to open with Kara here, please? Thank you. Um, Pia to mai te maramatanga, Pia to mai te rangamarie, Pia to mai te kaha me te araha mo tine kopapa. Let's be grounded in clarity, let's be peaceful, let's be strong and loving at this issue, bind together, and so it is. Thank you for that. So apologies, I've got an apology from Mayor King, who's attending the Zone 5 and 6 uh, conference in Queenstown. No other apologies have been received, as I understand. Would someone like to move? I've got uh, Councillor Dowler, seconded by Councillor Butler. All those in favour, please say aye. aye. Against? Carried. Um, my understanding is we've got uh, nobody in public forum, and we've got a bit of a reasonably tight time frame because we're scheduled to do a workshop about welcome and communities at about 11. But if we're a bit late, it won't matter too much. So nobody there. Uh, any new declarations of interest? None. No late items. Confirmation of the minutes of the policy and strategy meeting on the 9th of March. Is somebody willing to move those? Councillor McKenzie moved. Seconded Councillor Dalkey. Did I get that right? Close. Um, all those in favour, please say aye. Against, carried. Reports. So, oh, we'll do the confidential minutes now or at the end. Why don't we do them at the end? Yeah, we do them at the end because then we then we have to move. We don't have to move into confidential. All right, confidential minutes. We could do those now as well. So they were circulated. Would someone like to move the confidential minutes or a true and correct record? Move Councillor Dower, seconded Councillor McKenzie. I'll put that. All those in favour, please say aye. Against? Carried. But look at that, I got a hint from my uh, advisor on the side there that that goes for that chair's training. Thanks, Tara. Right, um, the chair's report, I've commented on the um, WCO and those final um, submissions were done earlier this week. As I said, that's still subdued to say, so I've done, said very little. And I, I had the opportunity to have a look at that bridge on the Great Taste Trail, the new bridge uh, over the Batten, and I think that's a real asset to, uh, to the community, and it was being well used, and it was impressive to see how well the log truck drivers were behaving on that road, because they certainly knew there were cyclists, because it is a narrow road over that uh, particular saddle. Any other matters that um, anybody wants to comment? If not, oh, Council Bright or Deputy yeah. Mayor Bright. Sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just in relation to the um, conservation order or the water on the Takaga River, where are we, is that going to be covered by someone? An update or it's in the report from um, Mr. Johnson. He just talks on that, but as I said, it's still subdued to say. Uh, there certainly was some comments um, in the submissions and um, in terms of farming, but until that order actually comes out, there's very little we can say. 
Okay. And just in relation to your trip up the, um, and I hate to say this, up to the bed, and they're probably lucky you went that week that you did rather than yesterday, because I understand that it's deteriorated, eroded, and graded got stuck. So you might have got your bike stuck. <laughs> well, I can say uh, your residents are very active because I was spotted by one of your uh, local uh, residents, and he held me up for half an hour. Talking about a road. I can have a pretty good guess who that is. <laughs> he lives on that road. He does. Uh, and it was rutted, and I went up there again on the weekend because I was checking out fresh water. And um, that road isn't that flash. And in places, it just needs another grade, but the weather hasn't helped. All right. So, no other questions of my report. Would someone like to um, move that it be received? Thank you, Deputy Mayor, and uh, seconded Councillor Maru. All those in favour, please say aye. Against, carry. Right, so presentation. We've got a presentation next. Um, uh, presentation yeah, that's at 10 a.m. So we'll start, we'll start with strategy and policy report. Yeah, the presentation is due for 10 o'clock on um, round zero. And that was that presentation was put in your pack to have a look at too. So um, it was certainly, I had a good look at it this week. So we start with you, Dwayne, and we've also got Diana. So the two of you are sharing it because um, Mr. Johnson is away this week. Gary Johnson's away. I think he's in Australia um, for holidays. Uh, so Diana's doing that and Dwayne's doing it. So who's going to do which first? Um, um, sure. but, uh, thank you, um, Mr. Chair. Yeah, so Jeremy, Jeremy Butler is on um, online as well as support with questions and as is Ellen and Walter in the background there to deal with any questions in relation to the area. In terms of um, section three of the report related to, to my area, um, I'll take it largely as read, probably just point out two things. Um, the first is a heads up, the resident survey will be kicking off. Um, we're doing pilot testing in the next week and following that, um, it'll kick off in earnest for about a month. So we'll be contacting three or 400 residents um, and doing our annual residence survey, uh, just in case you have any, any questions around why the council called you, that's why. Occasionally we do tell people, thank you very much, but we don't need to talk to you, where we've met our demographic quota. Um, and sometimes, um, you know, that, that stirs people up. Um, the other thing is um, just to acknowledge um, uh, the affordable waters reform changes. Um, up until this point, uh, me and my team have been operating on the assumption that, of course, that three waters would um, be handed over to new organisations on the 1st of July next year. And, you know, we're, 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 we're positioning to um, start including three waters in the LTP. Um, fortunately, Walter and his team have been doing a lot of work with the National Transition Unit on a, a future programme, so we have a good base. Um, um, there are a lot of questions that we have that you probably have too. Um, around what does this mean for this that? How does the transition work? When do we when do we when do we um, get formed? Because it is intended to be a transition. Not all entities will um, be formed on the first of July, twenty twenty six. There will be a couple that start earlier. Lots of questions, and I'm just sorry to say we don't have as many answers as you, as we might like at this point. But those will be coming from the government, Trump internal affairs, and the national transition unit over time. Um, Walter, sorry, you had a, an update you wanted to bring in relation to the joint waste minimisation management plan. Do you mind coming up to the table? Yeah, I, I just wanted to um, acknowledge that we were working on um, a review of the joint um, waste management and minimization plan together with uh, Nelson. Um, that was also under the assumption that a new legislation would have been released last year. Uh, so we, we were waiting for that for some time that has now been released um, uh, late last month. And uh, on reviewing, early review of that uh, information, we, we recommend that the work on the, on the waste plan is, is delayed so that we have more time to understand the um, implications of the New Zealand wastewater uh, waste. <laughs> I'm always thinking about water. Um, the New Zealand waste strategy and the implications on on our um, joint waste plan with Nelson. So basically, yeah, I'm recommending a delay there to uh, take a bit more time. Right. So, uh, Councillor Mara has got a question, and Deputy Mayor Bryant. So, Councillor Mara. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So, um, my question just relates to 
the classification of the existing reserves. So it talks about once that process is established for the two that are currently in that management plan, so Richmond Lakes and Murchison, will that also capture the work that was done for the Motueka Reserves review? Because I believe they were gazetted at the end of that process either, um, but the review was certainly done. Yeah, through the chair. Um, actually, I, I don't know. I'll pass on to Alan, hoping that he has the answer. Actually, I don't, but you know, maybe morning tea, I can have a chat with Anna and come, come back to you. Thank you. Yeah, cheers. Thanks. Yeah, I think we did some of them, but not all of them, if I remember rightly. Uh, Deputy Mayor Bryan? Firstly, just around the reserves, what I want to think about that. So, yeah, it's um, those two wards that are alluded to, that, that that process will go first, won't it? Richmond and Lakes Richardson. Um, that's going to be quite a lengthy process to talk into Anna yesterday. Is there any compilation that we need to make that quicker, or it just can take its course? Um, yeah, I mean, it, it is quite a lengthy process. I mean, that the whole process of trying to get all, make sure we un, have a good understanding of the legal status of all the different reserves and then where we need to have them gazetted, we have to then go through a process with, with DOC. So, yeah, so that does take a bit of time. Um, in some ways, we can sort of overlap that then with the... Uh, the early engagement and trying to uh, get from, from people the, the, their thoughts about what, what we should be doing with reserves. So that can sort of overlap. But yeah, it, it is a bit of a lengthy process, but we are moving forward with it. Um, I like, like everything else, it's a question of um, kind of the amount of staff resource we have with all the various bits of the program ongoing. So, so you know, you, know, you, will, you will appreciate Anna is heavily involved in the review of the Tasman Climate Action Plan and certainly working with us to make sure that the outcomes of that are well integrated into those long-term plan. So, it's, so you, we're, we're sort of moving as fast as we can, but it's, it is limited somewhat by, by A.O. Wilson awesome to do that. Thank you. And then just in relation to what Walter talked around the joint waste, how much um, delays do you think there's going to be? Because is that um, not important for, in some ways, it's important for the landfill uh, business share that to know what what sort of the targets are going to be and what's likely to be diverted or in relation to the waste levy, which also funds that. So yeah. Uh, so so it's it's not that we will stop all work on the on the plan. Actually, it, the, um, we are required to review the plan every six years. Uh, the plan was from twenty nineteen, so it still needs to be done by twenty twenty five, um, and. Um, we we still feel that we can make that deadline. Uh, we're waiting on some advice from MFE to uh, tell us what the interim timelines are and by by when we need to meet certain um, um, sub parts of the of the plan. I guess so. We will advise the council on 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 that when we when we hear back from MFE. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Councillor McKenzie. Um, thank you, through the chair. Just uh, a, a couple of questions, if I may. Um, firstly, the speed management plan. Um, you know, I'm just reflecting how often um, speeds on some of our rural roads are raised uh, in the community uh, meetings that I attend. I think our community is, is very keen for this work to proceed as soon as they possibly can. Um, I do note that we've got... We hope to have it finished, I guess, by um, early 2024 to get certified. It says that it's subject to the Joint um, Regional Land Transport Committee. So um, are we on track? Are there any roadblocks? How can we be assured that we're going to deliver this by the time frame that we've stated? Um, through the Chair, um, the Speed Management Plan um, process must encompass all of our roads, but it doesn't have to propose changes to all of our, um, the speed limits on all of our roads. Um, and, and there is a, a must do, do minimum um, that we have to do by the deadline proposed, which is we have to make changes to um, a certain percentage of um, uh, roads outside schools um, and lower them to, to 30 kilometres for the most part. Uh, beyond that, there is just scope and discretion for the council and the regional transport committee because you both have an important role in the process um, to make changes beyond that um, or how quickly you implement changes. In terms of, uh, we've had one workshop with the regional transport committee so far on this and um, 
I, I would say that there's still some further work to to do with that committee to form a kind of common view about how quickly they want to progress through the speed management plan. And we do intend to come and talk to council about that as well. And, and um, it's a slightly awkward process because it has to be certified through the RTC, but it actually ends up coming back to the joint councils anyway. So both, both the council and the RTC have an important stake in the decision-making process. All right, thank you. I mean, I guess we'll just see how it moves forward. I mean, I... From what I'm hearing in, in, in the community, I, I don't think they'll be satisfied just to address the issue of schools. I think their expectation is, is somewhat more than that. Um, and just a, a question, if I may, with regards to the um, Mapua Master Plan, um, I'm aware of the fact that, um, you know, I am one of the councillors who's um, designated to go on to the steering committee, um, I'm not sure that we've actually met yet, um, and the report mentions the target completion date, December 2023, um, where what's the next thing that we might see in relation to this body of work? Yeah, um, th thank you, Councillor. Um, I, I recall when we sought approval for this process, you predicted it might take longer, um, and I think it was prophetic. Um, one of the delays has been um, uh, sorting out a process, essentially, for getting EWI representation on the steering committee. Um, so, in fact, I think this Friday might be the um, day we've asked for nominations um, from the EWI representatives. So. Um, and we've just had a, we've only had a little bit of feedback so far, so we'll be chasing that. Um, essentially, that's the delay, making sure that we have full representation on the steering committee before the um, we form the first meeting. I've got Council Kidamon, and then I've got Council Button. Through you, Mr. Chair, regarding the waste minimisation delay from you're getting get direction from MFE, is that correct? How does that affect our staff? Um, does that free them up to you go know, to other jobs? Or, or you, you know, just give me a bit of a heads up of how that affects your team. Uh, yeah, thank you, through Chair. Unfortunately, it doesn't free up staff. We're actually short on staff. So it's a bit of a relief for us that we um, can take a bit more time as well. Um, and, and that we'll be working towards that 20, 2025 deadline of, of having the review done. Right. Councillor Butler. Okay. Um, yeah, just another question about the waste minimisation plan. Um, just looking ahead and looking at our um, emissions report that we've got on our agenda today, uh, is are you anticipating that uh, we'll need to uh, start work on trying to reduce food waste or organic waste going into our landfills? And have we been thinking about that? I can probably pick it up. I know um, one of my team has been, been working with David and others around it. It's certainly one of the things that will be considered through the, the waste assessment and, and the joint waste uh, management minimisation plan. Um, I have to say I'm not entirely across the government's um, new waste strategy, but I suspect that they're giving us a strong push in that direction also through, through that. So, yeah, it'll definitely be part of the thinking for, around that, yeah. Because it, it would be, you know, like being more... We, we could sort of be proactive about that, couldn't we? Because that is it is likely to be there, in fact, almost certainly, and it is something that can reduce our emissions, yeah. So my other question was just about reserves, and I, I understand, and just um, if I could just have clarification, that we're going through the different parts of the region doing the reserves in order. And I'm just thinking about reserves in Golden Bay and yep. um, is there, you know, where, where, where that sits on the schedule okay. of looking at reserves. I know that this, these processes take a long time. Sure. Yeah, we are we are working around the yeah the, the various wards, and yeah, you, yeah, unfortunately can't do them all at once. But um, I, again, I, if I can come back to you on a schedule for Golden Bay, um, that's certainly in our thinking. But I'm not exactly sure of the time frame at the moment. But can, okay. can come back to you. I can answer the question that Councillor Maru raised earlier. Now, so um, what needed to be done at the end of that process was that 
we needed to publish a notice in the New Zealand Gazette to classify the reserves. I understand from Anna that has been completed. Oh, I'll take it out of order. Just order. Councillor Dow. Down. I mean, uh, Councillor Dow was next, but we'll go to Councillor Marin. So just confirming that the, the gazetting and all that was done for the reserves that were reclassified that were called reserves but weren't classified as reserves at the time of that review. And now you might come to the table because it was your um, your project. Uh, sorry, sorry for lateness. Um, yes, so over the chair, when we did that project, it was only focused on reserves that were existing reserves subject to the Reserves Act already. They were the only reserves we looked at and those, but we went through everything and found out which ones had already been classified and which ones hadn't. And the process was to classify those that had never been classified. So that's all we did. Yeah. Thank you, Anna. Uh, Councillor Dow. So for the chair, um, that's, we're currently starting the Richmond and Lakes Mergers and War projects, so that will take at least another year, and then the next, the last war to do will be Golden Bay, so yeah, it just takes quite a while to do the research behind it. Uh, yes, that is the next on the list after these two. Yeah, so Dallas? Yeah, I agree with what Celia says, but just... Um bring everybody to the, the new to the table up to speed. When we introduced the recycling bin and the bottle bin several years ago, we also tried to introduce a green waste bin and the people in Richmond canned it because most of them complained that they didn't have room for a third bin. And because they are the biggest users of the service, it wasn't introduced. So just be aware if you try and throw another bin in someone's front yard, we might have the same people turning up here telling us no way. Interesting comment because there is a commercial provider that is providing those green bins, and I use one um, yeah. myself. So I don't go to the, um, the the landfill; it goes in a green waste bin, picked up once a fortnight. So there is a service there already as part of Can Plan. Um, so the, so that is happening. Well, uh, and private enterprise can sometimes do things um, quicker and uh, cheaper than us. We need to acknowledge that. Diana, we'll move to you. I think well, that's all the questions. So, and Jeremy's going to help you if there's any things in relation to um, plane changes, as I understand it. Yes, that's right. Uh, so he's on, I see he's on Zoom up there. Mori Nakoto. Um, I'm filling in for Barry today because he's, he's away on holiday. Very well deserved for the next three weeks. Um, First of all, I'd take the report as read, and Jeremy and myself are happy to answer any questions. But before we move to that, I would just like to introduce the councillors to our new staff member. So behind me have Charlotte Shun, who's come from Cawthron, and so she's replaced Pauline Webby in the policy planner role. So Charlotte's portfolios is land disturbance, forestry, contaminated land, and hazardous substances. So it's going to be busy time for Charlotte, uh, bearing in mind the national inquiry that's happening at the moment, particularly around forestry. Um, so I'd like to welcome Charlotte today to council for meeting for the first time. And my understanding is she actually came to us from before Cawthron, she was in Auckland or in that part of the country. So it's a good place to recruit people from um, from lo for local government. This, this is a nicer place to live in Auckland. And it's cheaper. And you can walk to work. Um, the report's there. Uh, if anybody hasn't got a question at this stage, I'll just ask about. Uh, I'll, 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 we'll start yeah, with Deputy Mayor Brian. Yeah, yeah. How are you, sir? So, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just, uh, Diane, in relation to plan changes and the um, we grind on with the plan change in Murchison um, another two or three months before we get it operative. Uh, some frustration was expressed at the um, long-term plan engagement around how long these processes are doing and how um, frustrating it is for those people. Is there anything that we can do to speed the process up? Uh, through the Chair and 
Thank you, Deputy Mayor, for the question. I think it's quite helpful that, that we have that discussion and I appreciate the frustration from landowners who are involved particularly with that plan change. Um, we have the issue in terms of, obviously, we have our statutory timeframes, but plan changes are also reliant on council, I suppose, internal timeframes. And a good example is with the Murchison one, obviously, we received the decision um, from the hearing in December but that decision then needed to come up to this committee for adoption. And unfortunately, um, the first committee of this year was not until early March. Um, and I think there was a bit of a, a delay. Usually committees tend to start in February, but because of the elections last October, there was a bit of a knock-on effect. Um, obviously, that committee has now adopted that decision, and now we need to put it into the TRMP. And that is quite a cumbersome process just the administration burden behind it. And we tend to do TRMP updates in batches of plan changes. So the current one, which the Murchison plan change would be included in, uh, staff are working to the timeframe of early December to get that notified. And along with the Murchison plan change, there's also plan change 73, the omnibus plan change. So the previous council recall, that's quite a complicated plan change um, to put into the plan because there were so many different topics around it. Um, so staff are trying to work in a timely manner. Obviously, we're limited by our own resources and the cumbersome process that we're having to work with. Once the update is notified in early June in relation to the Murchison plan change, we then go through that statutory 30 working day process for appeals. Um, so we can expect by mid-July um, we will see if there's been any appeals or not to the Environment Court. If there aren't any appeals, um, we can kind of take that as being operative. However, the next plan change is not scheduled to August in terms of the TRMP update. So provided there are no appeals, it will be actually within the plan operative at that time. The issue here is we can see the benefits of moving to an e-plan process because it will knock out a lot of that, I suppose, manual administrative um, work that's currently required with our process. Um, and now through the RMA reform, and we're seeing that the TRMP is going to be kicking around for at least another 10 years, um, it brings up that opportunity to actually put the existing TRMP into an e-plan framework. So, council, so staff are currently scoping out what that might look like. And once we've done that scoping exercise, we'll be able to bring that to councillors um, to have further discussion. So a couple of questions, if I may, rising from there. Mm -hmm. So if there is an appeal, yes. that the process just takes longer. Yes. So that's resolved. And secondly, the e-plan and making it more, will that make it more enabling to, to, to get this um, process done quicker. I think that's the frustration of that because it must be by the time we got to hearing it was probably six or twelve months down from when we first started talking about it. So it looks like it's going to be close to a two year process, doesn't it? Yeah, and um in terms of doing TRMP updates, the actual manual process, that is very cumbersome. So yeah. we can see some efficiencies will be gained by moving to an e-plan platform. Right. But well, that's going to take a little while as well, isn't it? That's right, yes. So, yeah. And then just, um, so thank you for that. And just further on down in the um, projects, um, this is with the, the chart. We've got the future development strategy is complete. We, I thought there was an appeal on that. Where, where is that appeal at? So my, my understanding that's a legally privileged confidential discussion at this time. Right. So is it operative or not? I guess is that because that's what you say from the now operative implementation underway. Apologies if the, the council could repeat the question I was chatting to the chair. <laughs> <laughs> well the chair should know better than the doctor than the chat. <laughs> it wasn't a chat, it was about some processes. Do you mean it? Um, the question is, the text says uh, the FDS 22-2052, FDS now operative implication, implementation underway, where does that leave us in right that we're aware of an appeal? Um, uh, through the Chair, I, um, 
um, the, FDS, the FDS is completed and it is our acting strategic document. The fact that, that there might be someone who wants to challenge aspects of it doesn't change that until such time as that process is completed and the courts find against counsel. Right. My understanding is that there's a judicial review, mm. um, and I don't think that's Jeremy, secret. And I'm going to ask Jeremy to just comment, but uh, I understood it was operative. Yeah. So, Mr. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yeah, that, that's all I was going to clarify is that it is a judicial review. Um, so it, it doesn't hold any weight um, until such time as a judge looks at that and will make a determination on the process, not on the outcome. So the so it's a judicial review to the High Court. The Environment Court's not involved. So a judge who'd be looking at that would only be looking at was the process fair um, and um, and appropriate. <clears throat> One of the challenges here is that, we're, that there's very little in the way of um, clarity as to what an appropriate process is for an FDS. So uh, we're not, not quite sure how they're going to determine that. But um, that, yes, it certainly still stands in the meantime until such time as it's found that there was a, um, an issue with the process, if that's the case. That's fine. Uh, I've got Council Walker and then I've got Councillor Dowler. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just a point of clarification. Um, on the chart, it's got Robinson Road speed reduction. It's captured targeted completion dates third quarter 2024. I thought that uh, that was going to be 2023. Because um, we've already gone out and we're consulting. That, that is meant to be 2023. Thank Correct. you. Yep. And there's one other little typo glitch is that today's deputy chair is not Councillor Hill, if that could be altered too. Thank you. That's correct. Thank you, Councillor Walker. Councillor Dow. Uh, and I just might comment in relation to that process. Uh, we need to go as quickly as we can for plan changes, but we have to follow process, otherwise, it will come around and bite us. Because local government, if you don't follow the process, it will get you in trouble, um, and as um, staff know very well, and I can remember having worked in central government, if you didn't follow the process, you lost, uh, and it's not fun to lose. Councillor Dowling. I'm just going to refer to 4.24 and 4.25 as one support territory strategic plan, and then the Port Monoiga strategic plan. Uh, in the 4.24, it talks about the fact that, um, where is it? Uh, the project was presented to the Golden Bay Community Board at the 3rd of April meeting. And you read the 4.25, and no part of that says that the report will be referred to the Motueka Community Board. So I'm just wondering whether that can be included, please, as part of the process. Through the chair, yes, I can confirm we'll add that into the work program. Thank you. Right. So, uh, any more questions of um, Diana? If not, could I ask for a mover to receive the report? Councillor Ellis, a seconder, second of Councillor Maru. All those in favour, please say aye. aye. Against, carried. Thank you, Diana. Thank you, Dwayne, for that. Now, uh, we've got now a presentation in uh, relation to. It says common ground here, but I actually thought it was slightly different. So Zola, Zola Rose, if you'd like to come up to the table, and I think the presentation was loaded on the system. So are you able to bring it up? That's Tara. Um, so I think we've allocated 15 or so minutes. If you like to uh, leave some time for questions, I thought your presentation was very good on from what I read. Um, and if you manage the time, and uh, we're not too pressed for time today, so it'll be nice that uh, councillors are able to ask you a few questions at the end. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. Uh, do I have this uh, switch thing, or do I tell someone? Oh, yeah, that'd be good. Sometimes it doesn't always work. Uh, Technology is not never my friend, but others might be much better. Great. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Zola Rose, and my enterprise is called Common Ground. I'm a community development and housing 
um, specialist, researcher, and consultant. Uh, so I've prepared this presentation for the council today as a means of uh, raising awareness and looking at where there are uh, where's potential opportunities um, and partnership. So the presentation is called Enabling Regenerative Housing Development as a Catalyst for Social, Ecological, and Economic Well-Being in the Tasman District. So as we know, we do have a lot of problems with our conventional housing um, in terms of environmental, a lot of emissions, and a lot of waste. Um, also environmentally, we've got climate change causing flooding and slips with the way that we're um, designing our towns and cities. Um, our current mode of building is quite isolating with high fences and people feeling disconnected from their neighbors. And then, of course, we have the affordability issue of people resorting to caravans, uh, cars, and uh, sleeping in um, garages and that kind of thing. So we've got multiple layers of housing issues. Um, so We've been driven quite a bit by a conventional residential development mode, uh, by de developer driven, I would say, um, which has landed, uh, landed us with um, housing development that doesn't look like a living system. Uh, that would be on the left, what would be a typical conventional residential development. Can't really see the life in that space. And I would like us to move our narrative, our paradigm to a more regenerative residential development that really values living systems, human life, um, ecological life, um, and that is more sustainable as well. And it can also be more affordable. Uh, so regenerative development, uh, just to give a little uh, brief definition, um, it enables people to understand themselves and the places where they live as complex, evolving living systems. It designs and creates new ways of living in harmony with those systems and creates systemic solutions that have multiple layers of social, ecological, and economic impact intergenerationally. And then the other uh, part of housing, which has been missing in Aotearoa, um, except for the papakainga approach, is uh, collective and community-led housing. It's a sector that's quite large in the UK um, and in the US and in Europe, but we don't really see it here. Um, and that's where there's opportunity for partnership. It's um, that missing middle that you might have heard that term. It's a demographic that is uh, at the moment an increasing uh, group of people who uh, cannot afford the market and who are making perhaps a little bit too much to be served by social housing. Um, it does mean that it, it requires meaningful community engagement and consent throughout the development process with the groups of people uh, who want to be building their own homes. It usually is a local community group or an organization that owns, manages, and stewards the homes in a manner of their choosing and benefits to the local area and specified community must be clearly defined and legally protected in perpetuity. So there's an aspect of it being nonprofit. So people are doing housing for the sake of housing themselves, but they usually are values driven as well. So there is usually um, aspects of affordability, ecology, and social connection within that type of housing. You'll see those values come through in the types of neighborhoods that people end up developing when they're given the agency and the assistance to develop um, on their, with their own uh, guidance. So an example in the UK is an organization called Community Led Homes. So this is that missing middle sector and with the support of the government, both uh, central and local government, um, this particular uh, research um, conducted shows that there's 499 community led housing projects that have already been completed. These are projects. So these are basically neighborhoods, um, which is about the equivalent of 26,799 homes and underway are 895 housing projects uh, with 21,722 homes to be completed in the next 10 years. So that's a sector that we don't have in this country at the moment. We've got looking at what is social housing building or kind of order, what is developers, what are they trying to build? And we've, we're losing a lot of the potential that we have to develop a whole bunch of housing if we are looking to do that in partnership with community-led groups. 
So our conventional paradigm of housing development is quite degenerative. Um, it is designed for the car, working commercial areas are driving distance away, food is growing far away, it's dependent on centralized infrastructure, has linear water waste and energy systems, is profit and investment driven, has limited to no future, future resident input, the people who will be living there. Uh, it's built for the ease of consenting. It's financed um, because of its limiting risk. Uh, land is considered an inanimate object. It's just a piece of property. Uh, it values only one form of capital, which is economic or financial. And the design really ends when the residents move in. We need to really move to a living systems approach that is regenerative with the way we do housing. What that means is that we look at housing that is designed as a living system with the land and the people. Working commercial areas are walking distance away. Food is close to kitchens. There's localized infrastructure for uh, water, energy, and waste. Housing is seen as a human right, inclusive of future residents' inputs and needs. It's built for long-term resiliency. Uh, the, it's financed uh, looking at affordability. Land is a living system. It, the values are also those other forms of capital, human, social, and natural. And the design takes into account evolutionary living systems. So there's many different forms that this can take. This is just a few photos that I have found from suburban looking, where you've got attached housing to eco villages, where they're more spread out. So you can do this inner, um, in an urban area or in a rural area. Uh, this is the Petersboro Housing Cooperative in Christchurch, which is um, serving many families um, affordably. It's running itself like a cooperative. So some of the housing types that we see are co-housing, or you might have heard of these in the news, or maybe you've even visited some. We don't have too many um, of these because of legislation and financing has been really restricting these um, projects actually from getting either underway or finished. So co-housing, uh, the most notable of that is Earth Song. Uh, cooperative housing, we don't actually have legislation in this country that allows cooperative housing yet. Eco-villages, agri-hood, which is the focus of food, uh, tiny home community, which is something I'd really like to help to enable in our region, pocket neighborhoods, which is maybe the way you grew up in, uh, you know, with the cul-de-sac, and then ecological land cooperative, which helps to redevelop rural land uh, with a food focus. And then we've got community land trusts, CLTs, and inclusionary housing zoning. Those two work really well together. The CLT, um, the council really does enable this. If you look at the UK, the best examples are where the council has been an active partner to create the CLT. The main purpose is to um, preserve housing to be affordable for future generations so that um, in our current model, we've got housing um, affordable, but then when it changes hands to the next homeowners, it is sold on the market and therefore it, it loses its status as an affordable house. A CLT enables that. And then the inclusion, inclusionary housing policy, which you can see down in the Queenstown Lakes Community Housing Trust, um, makes land and funds available through the rezoning process to be used for affordable housing. So you might say, well, how are we going to get the land for the CLT? Uh, the inclusionary housing is the means to do that. So the CLT is a very important uh, component if we're looking at truly perpetually affordable housing, which is something that we need to do. Otherwise, we're losing subsidies to the, um, to the next homeowner. Uh, just to make you aware, there is a subdivision handbook that has been created. Um, it sits under Standards New Zealand, and I'd like to see it be put into use. Um, it uses the concepts of eco-villages and co-housing to provide guidelines for alternative design and the use of technologies and land development and subdivision in New Zealand, provides guiding documentation associated with alternative designs based on environmental and social responsiveness, and where this handbook and the guidance it provides is adopted by councils, a degree of uncertainty will be removed from the resource consent process, which is a really big stumbling block for housing that wants to do more of a localized um, land-based way of developing. This was written by uh, Lisa Ghibellini, who is the current housing strategy at Nelson City Council. So just uh, quickly to, to summarize what um, councils can do to enable regenerative and community-led housing, it's to collaborate with collective housing projects, of which there's a number going on in the region. 
um, to facilitate local participatory process. To be able to prioritize and enable housing developments that restore and regenerate social and natural environments to remove barriers and rewrite planning regulations to keep up with the environmental, economic, and social realities of our time, and to enable and make land available for tiny homes and tiny home communities and to legitimize them. And more of what can be done to look at the subdivision for people in the environment handbook, establish a Tasman community land trust, establish inclusionary zoning policy, build the capacity of a council navigator role if one exists or create one to support community led housing. There's examples in the UK of how that works. Uphold Te Tiriti and Te Ao Maori in housing. Gain permaculture design capability, which allows for that bigger understanding gain regenerative practitioner capability, and adopt an innovative workplace culture to allow for these innovative ideas to be able to be um, uh, quickly adopted. So for more information, I don't know if I've, any of you have had this strategy document. I can send it out to you via email. It basically is a summary of everything I've talked about, but with links to all the examples. So you're able to get really good um, understanding of what each one of these models look like that I've spoken about. So I'm currently a Tasman resident. I've just recently moved in my tiny home to a Riverside community. So I'm available um, to, you know, to, be, to be coming in again, to have meetings if you want to, to speak more about these kinds of things. So happy to be a part of your, um, your region now. I've just moved from Nelson and um, yeah, look forward to hearing your questions. What what do you want to know about and or tell me something that you find interesting about what I've said? Thank you. Thank you, uh, Zola, uh, and thank you for your presentation. Councillor Killamore. Thank you very much for that presentation, Zola. My first thought on it is how we're throwing everything out. We're starting all afresh. Is there anything that you can see in your presentation that we can build on for what we're currently doing correctly and that the next steps, or do we, because a lot of this here involves central government, not just local government. So that's my question is, is there anything that we can build on we're currently doing now, doing the steps that will help this, or is it more led from the central government, not local government area? Yeah, I definitely think Local government has a lot of a role to play. As I mentioned, um, the CLT, that's a good local government move to make. Um, if you look at Kapiti Coast District Council, their housing strategy, uh, they're currently undergoing uh, the creation of a community land trust as a council, and Hamilton um, has done the same. Again, that's really important for releasing land out of private and into public um, stewardship. Um, and then that could facilitate a number of different innovative developments, because usually when we have developer led housing, one is maximizing profits and maximizing land space versus a CLT. You're not trying to maximize the profit on that land. You can leave it for other purposes like ecological and you're able to develop more innovatively on that on that land. Um, I mentioned that subdivision for people in the environment. That is something that is replicable um, or applicable, um, particularly for greenfields developments. Um, there is a planning rule that Tasman has called the cooperative living planning rule, where multiple ha homes can be done in a rural, uh, rural zone two and rural residential, I believe. Um, and it would be building the, um, the ability, when I spoke to a planner um, recently, I think it was Kirsten about that, I said, well, this was done in 2016, this cooperative living rule, there was submissions made on it, people were interested in it, but what's happened since 2016, who's used the planning rule to be able to have multiple occupancy on rural land? And she said she didn't really know of any that have used it to date, and that's six, seven years of, of uh, time that has gone by, council put their money in that process to begin with, why isn't it being used? So council can make available how to understand what that planning rule means and to facilitate um, groups to be able to, to utilize it and not be restrictive about it, but be enabling, because that's where tiny homes and um, more um, sustainable smaller homes could take advantage of that planning rule. So it's how do we get that knowledge out there and then facilitate. Um, I've got three more people. Oh, sorry, let me, uh, okay, yeah, so yeah. that's just, got, a, yeah. that's a very good question. I'd like to, you know, yep. I can meet with you. You can do that offline. Yes, I've yes. Got three more people to ask questions. Uh, I've got Deputy Mayor Branch, 
Councillor Shellcross and Walker, and that's where we'll probably cut it off. Uh, although if there's time at the end, I've got a little one myself. But as the chair, I'll take that property. Deputy Mayor Brian. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I've got a couple of questions, if I may, so uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, firstly, and you've partly covered an answer to that has been a land trust. You see that as um, being a community type organisation that would facilitate some of the things you're talking about. Um, do you see that be like a governance body or actually physically purchasing the land and actually doing what you're uh, advocating for? Yeah, so it is set up as a nonprofit. The way it worked in Hamilton was that there was a council person who sat on the board. Um, ideally, the board should be tripartite, some residential, some expertise, and then some representing of just the local community. Um, it can be region-wide. So for the Hamilton one, they did make it the Waikato Community Lands Trust so that it has an option to purchase money. Central government gave Hamilton $2 million to purchase their first property, um, of which they're doing at the moment. It was ring-fenced for Hamilton, but I suspect it can get um, more funding or donations in the future. Um, how Kapiti is doing it, it would be good to look at how they're um, going to be looking at what the role for the council is in that one. I've also written um, an 80-page document on how councils can create community land trusts specifically for Aotearoa, so I can make that available and you can kind of get a feel for the role that council does play within facilitating the establishment of a community land trust. So it isn't... Um, managed by council, but there is usually one person who sits on the board that acts as that intermediary. Thank you. I knew I'd be interested in seeing that document, actually. Um, and then in the presentation you had about how councils can enable regenerative and community and remove barriers and rewrite plans. But at, before you come in, I had a little bit of a rant about how long it takes under the current process. So rewriting rules will take quite some time, and I'm not being disrespectful to anyone, but it's just how councils are. So it's, it'd be quite a long window to do that. Uh, uh, do you see that? Who would drive that? The other way to do um, taking an innovative project is to give it a short period of time based on sort of research of... Um, uh, let's see how this goes for five years. Let's just give it a try to see if this innovative kind of development is something that uh, we can trial to. So it's a little bit of a relaxing of for a particular project of the rules. Um, there's an eco village in the Netherlands um, that's um, working to uh, do, do the whole 17 sustainable development goals within that. And they got uh, a new zoning applied to it called the experimental zone. So they're allowed to do a lot of experimenting to be able to reach those 17 SDGs um, without having to constantly go back and re-ask for permission for every single thing. They do have a lot of partnerships, universities as well. So that data collection and research uh, component is there, which I do think is is important as well, so that it's not just any random group, it's actually got a bit of um, good research methodology behind it. But I think that that's very um, possible. Um, and I've also seen um, there's an interesting organization, Microlife in America, and they've been bridge building between groups and council to look at, again, for a specific piece of land, how can we create policy just for this piece to see how it works? And then is it replicable? All right, thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Council Shellcross. Yeah, um, thanks, Zola, for that awesome presentation. Um, I was actually on a job site yesterday talking to a tiny home builder, actually, and about all the stuff, so it's good timing. Um, yeah. The um, tiny home communities, is there any of those operating in New Zealand yet, do you know of? There is the Tiny Home Hub, which is an advocating body. Um, in terms of communities, I'm actually um, coordinating what's called the Regenerative and tiny home development think tank. So we're really trying to get around policies um, that have to do with both developing land in a regenerative way and with tiny homes as being part of it. Um, PricewaterhouseCoopers is busy working with one of the members of the um, collaborative to be able to give sort of like an outline of legally what that's looking like. Uh, so they're kind of spearheading it that is in North Island. There's not really any that are operating that I know of that are not like a trailer park that are actually proper communities with might have shared a lot of shared facilities that are um, intentionally designed. Um, I'm hoping that we're going to be 
the first. Yeah. Uh, Nelson's also spearheading tiny homes as well. They're quite interested, not whether you know, but they've allocated $15,000 per tiny home within their um, housing reserve budget um, to any project that has tiny homes involved in it. So I would love to see something similar um, here in this council. But yeah, that that is, I am in a tiny home. I am a community development specialist. That's an area that I'm looking to, I'm learning a lot and I'm looking to help to, to enable something like that. Yeah, no, I definitely see an opportunity at something I'm quite keen on. Um, and I might catch up later on because this guy had some really good ideas, you know, because obviously he built them. <laughs> There's been a bit of a shift for this sound of it though, um, with the sales of tiny homes at the moment as well. You know, they're, of slowing down, but he's got some really good ideas. So thank you very much. Yeah, well, that's the thing. People can't find land, or at least they don't want to be in somebody's back paddock. It's, yeah, so we do need the land for the people. So it comes, it's a chicken or egg thing, really. I had a tiny home for months and I couldn't find land to put it on. I finally got in Riverside, which is a beautiful place for me to be. Yeah. All right, well, we'll move oh, on you. to uh, Councillor Walker. And yeah. The last question, other than I might have a comment, but I don't think. Thank you, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, public Ianga model. How does that work? Like, does are there some some similarities with what they're doing to what you're looking at? Yeah, I think both the public Ianga model and um, the sort of collective uh, ownership of land is something quite challenging um, in this country because the banks don't like to finance things on the land. So Papakainga does have um, rules that are applicable uh, for them. Ma what can happen on Maori land is different than what can happen on sort of and some other different communally owned land, but I would say that there's probably equal challenges, um, particularly regarding the financing. But I would say in terms of ideology or philosophy, there's a lot in common. So I would say a lot of the people who are interested in co this collective housing ideas are very much aligned with a more indigenous worldview approach. Um, of the land, of care of people, of wanting to do a lot of sharing of resources and, and, and activities. So definitely there's a, a large crossover. It's just legally and financially, um, you know, there's differences between what can be done on public kind of land and, and other land. Hmm. Massive opportunity. Yep. <laughs> and you, did, uh, you covered my point in that in relation to finance. Banks are difficult when you do that. Um, when I did some work at the Waimea Village, first bank turned us down flat because um, it was it was a joint thing. So that will be one of the real challenges going forward. So I thank you um, for your presentation. I'm sure, councillors, through this, you can um, get Zola's email and take stuff offline with her if you think there is something in your wards that particularly could help you going forward. So thank you, Zola, for your for your time and putting that together. You obviously, Council Sharcross wants to touch base with you, and I'm sure someone from Michael Wakeham will as well. Um, yeah, my website is commonground.net.nz, so you can even book a meeting with me easy. I have a button you push and it puts it in my calendar. So yeah, thank you very much for your time. I appreciate your questions as well. Thank you. Uh, Neil, uh, we've got you on Zoom, so if you could, um, We'll move to the report in relation to, isn't it, our, our council on missions? Yes. So, uh, Neil, I've got some questions in relation to that, but they're relatively simple. Uh, but if you'd like to uh, have the floor for a start. Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'll take the report as read and happy to answer any questions you might have. I might start. So um, I was with the uh, landfill manager last night uh, at another meeting and and uh, I, I had looked at your report and um, interestingly at our landfill, joint landfill, we use um, a lot of the emissions to heat the hospital. But we still, my understanding is you count what goes in. So it doesn't matter... Um, how efficient we are in catching the greenhouse gases that come from that uh, site, we still have to count what we go to landfill, even though we're doing quite well from that point of view. He said the number of um, 
the amount of carbon produced there is actually very small. Uh, yes, to... yeah, that, that is the case. So we only currently count what, what goes in and that's because of our uh, Ministry for the Environment methodology that we use. Um, there's, there's talk about uh, aligning with the landfill going into next year. And that's something that we're, we're having discussion with Nelson City Council on that. Um, as far as I'm aware, there's, there's no other councils in, in the country that, um, that using the, the landfill methodologies uh, to measure their emissions um, in terms of our corporate emissions, but that's definitely something that we're working towards. Um, and I agree that we, we need to be accounting for that uh, better moving forward. And, and I understand too that we don't account for old landfills. So, you know, we would have emissions from old landfills, and I'm thinking of um, Eves Valley where we flare it. So, so one way is we're, we aren't counting where we're doing something really well, but in the other way, we don't count, account for old ones. And Nelson City would be the same. So there's some anomaly in uh, how we do this, I would have thought. Is that a fair comment? I mean, yeah, that, that is the case. We don't, we don't account for closed landfill. And, and that's because, again, of the methodology that we use. And the same principle applies for, for next year where we're looking into changing that. Unfortunately, we didn't get around to, to doing it this year. Um, we, didn't, we didn't even realize that we could change it at this stage, um, but we've received positive assurance from our auditors moving forward that, that we can do that. So yeah, that's one of the changes that we're looking at making and that'll be able to, to better collect data moving forward. But it might mean that our emissions will, will, will go up when we account for those closed landfills, um, but also we'll be able to better represent any of the reduction efforts that, that we make. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I've got um, two people with questions so far, uh, Deputy Mayor Bryan and Councillor McKenzie. Thank you, Mr Chair. So just to follow on from that, the Chair, Neil, um, I'm at 7.6 in your report, um, where you talk about we have an active waste minimisation program, program, which I don't have any problem with. But the, just around the approximately 50% of all waste currently received at the landfill is organic. Are you talking broadly? Because that wouldn't just be food waste. So you're counting um, likes of builders' waste as organic. I believe that's the case. Um, I think Anna might have a bit more information on that. Is that, is that the case, Anna? Yeah, yeah, no, that's correct. Yeah, all types of organic waste, not just food waste. Right. Yeah, food so waste quite small. Seems very unlikely. Could you pull the speaker close to you, Anna? You've got a very soft voice. <laughs> yeah, no, that's correct. But it seems very unlikely that we could do anything with builders' waste uh, organically to um, reduce that going to land. So there are several options, and the emissions reduction plan is. Um, looking to potentially prohibit organic waste to landfill by 2030. So as a country, they're looking at what to do in terms of converting organic waste from landfill. Um, so we have at the Richmond um, area now, it's that new shed thing's been built where they're bringing um, all the builder waste and to, to try to separate it out and, and see if it can be diverted from landfill as a trial. So I guess it is something that we're... Has that already started? Um, yeah. I don't know, has it actually been built now? I think it's pretty much oh, yeah, about yeah, to but start. The process yeah. hasn't started yet. The, uh, I'm not 100% sure. Through. Yeah, I think it's about to, right. if it hasn't already. Yeah. Yeah, because one sort of um, normally thinks when they're, well, in any case, I guess, when organic, you think of organic food waste, which I would have thought would be a much lower percentage. Okay. And, and, Thank you, Mr. Chair. Councillor McKenzie. Thank you very much through the chair. Um, thank you for the report, uh, Neil. Um, I mean, I guess just to be slightly provocative, we've got existing targets in our Tasman Climate Action Plan. We've got some revised targets in our draft. Um, my reading of this report, we aren't going to meet them. So. I mean, what planning have we done for the major interventions that are actually going to mean that we can meet these targets that we're setting for ourselves? Because on the current trajectory, you know, it's actually just not going to happen. 
yeah, through the chair. So I guess Landfo is our key opportunity, and there are two main streams of um, work underway there. So the Ministry for the Environment has like a two-year budget, um, I don't know what's it called, funding round where you can apply for uh, feasibility studies and business cases for diverting and managing organic waste and methane emissions. So Nathan Clark is um, looking at one to do with um, capturing the gas and what to do with the gas that's produced anyway at the landfill. And then um, David Stevenson's team is looking at especially food waste and diverting that, but other options as well. So, yeah, I'm not sure when that's going to be brought to you for further discussion, but it is happening in the background and nationally we're all being encouraged to, you know, look at how we're at, we can divert that waste from landfill and reduce waste generally. You know, there's the whole waste assessment that's underway at the moment. Um, the new waste strategy has come out from government just in the last couple of weeks with further direction and so that will incorporate it into the long-term planning process. So things are happening. It's, I guess you just haven't had a, a, a briefing on it recently. Yeah. Okay, well, I think it will be good to get uh, for us as a, as a team to get to get more across it. So um, I'm interpreting your comment as, as being one with some degree of optimism. Yeah, some. <laughs> I tend to agree with you, Councillor McKenzie, but when, when you look at the report, there are some things going on in the background, like use of solar power at um, Bells Island, which is going ahead, because I saw electricity. And in the South Island, I think all our electricity is generated by either hydro or uh, solar. So we don't use coal in the South Island. So that's a good thing. And we don't get electricity that comes from the North Island. We tend to send it north. Um, but I th and the other thing was transport. So we're changing to electric and hybrid vehicles uh, and it's being speeded up and we're also going to reduce our fleet. So the, there is things happening, but we've got a long way to go. And I just think the accounting for landfill when way ours is going. And the other one is weather events. When we have a significant weather event, a huge amount can go to landfill, but we have managed to divert some of it um, this year out of um, the Nelson floods, a number, uh, a lot of that um, silt and stuff is actually stored currently at Best Island and is going to be used uh, as part of fill out there. So, so we have diverted a considerable amount um, from landfill where if you looked at our events in the past, it's, it's just all gone to landfill, which is a, a pretty sad state. Right. Uh, through the chair, I, um, one of the things that Anna alluded to was around and the other around the accounting for landfills. And while it's not represented here, uh, last year I think it was um, the council, the Nelson Tasman Landfill Business Unit, um, put on a new flare system at York, which improved the efficiency of um, that burn and extraction and reuse, and then used the old flare system and installed it at um, East Valley. And um, you know that that. Um, that is not accounted for adequately here, but um, that the amount of CO2 equivalent emissions from recollection, and it'll tell me if I'm wrong, was something like 80,000 cubic tonnes a year or something in that order, which represented something like 15% of our regional transport emissions, not council's transport emissions, but regional transport emissions. Um, and so, you know, that was a very meaningful action that the councils undertook, but it's not adequately represented in, in this table because of the accounting methodology. Um, I also note that um, there are, once we readjust our accounting methodology, we'll see the payback on those kind of interventions, and if there, even if there's not an economic payback in terms of a reduction of CO2. And in the future, um, you know, the intention is that you'll see here that our Suppliers transport fleets and our own transport fleets make up the next largest component outside of wastewater. I'm assuming wastewater goes to another party, so that'll be their problem in the future. But um, so there are there are definitely opportunities in the wings to reduce it further um, just because it's only reduced a little bit and not on track from an annual perspective. It doesn't mean there aren't many things going on. Yeah. That's good to know. Councillor Dowler, and then I'll be looking for someone to move receiving the report. Yeah, okay. So I know of um, people that have tried to do a public-private partnership council over technology that's been introduced overseas, uh, reducing waste 
to oil through plants. Uh, this particular, one particular one I can bring to straight up is the person who wanted to take all our old tyres and he would have water processed them. And very little risk to council. All the, all the council really had to do was provide the tyres. He just needed a supply to make it a viable business. Uh, he's still out there. He's still keen to go. Council Brian and I went to a, a workshop what, a year ago now and looked at a process that had been started in Christchurch. We got flattened by the earthquake. And it was at the sewer plant, or wastewater plant down there that was going to process stuff. I've still got all the information at home. So there is technology out there that we could we could come into. Unfortunately, the one from Christchurch was needing a lot of money from council to, to go, but there are a Nathan was looking at other plants overseas that are doing the same thing. So eventually when that technology is finally adopted by councils, not us, just councils, uh, we're going to see a major difference. But it's just the fact that someone doing it first, saying that it's working and proving it's working and everybody else will jump on board and it'll help the country. I'm happy to move. Thank you. Okay, if there's no more questions, I'm looking for a seconder to receive the report. Uh, seconded Councillor Butler. All those in favour, please say aye. Against? Care. Right, so um, I think that brings us to the end, and we're pretty much on, on the time. I know, and I was, I'm going to ask if Councillor Hill, are you still online, Councillor Hill? Of course, Chair. Would you like to uh, close with Karakia for us, please? Yes, I, I'm happy to do that. Karakia Tato, Tafari Maanga Hua o Te Tai Ao, Maya Papa Tonu Kui Takoto Nei, Kia Rangi Nui E Tu Iho Nei, Tuturi Whakamaua Kia Tina, Tina Huie Taiki E. So thank you, everyone. So that draws us to a conclusion. We've got a workshop. I think we should uh, have an extra five minutes, so we'll come back here at five past. 11. How's that? And a cup of tea.